Hello, Will. Uh, my name is Eddie Quint, and I am a martial arts teacher. That's what I do. That's who I am. Well, uh, uh, over the past 30 years, I've studied uh, God, several arts. Um, a little bit of background about me. When I was uh, 18, uh, I left a pub just outside Birmingham, uh, and there were some guys abusing some girls at a bus stop. Uh, I stepped in, told the guys to leave the girls alone, and one of the guys pulled out a flick knife. Uh, and as a result of stepping in, I was stabbed six times. I got stabbed in the right ventricle in my heart, my liver, my bowel, my gallbladder, my head, and my thigh were all kind of punctured in the attack. Um, so, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty uh, tough time. And uh, I kind of vowed from that day forward, you know, rehabilitation wise, uh, I was never going to be a victim again. And uh, that's when the kind of martial arts journey kind of started. Uh, I had to go and see a heart specialist. Uh, and he said to me, have you ever thought about taking up a combat sport? And I said, I said, Doc, I've thought about it. And he said, well, son, I suggest you do it. So I kind of went to my local uh, martial arts school, knew nothing about martial arts at that time. Uh, I'd heard about karate, I'd heard about jiu-jitsu, jiu -jitsu, you know, judo. And uh, yeah, I met a guy called Steve Maycock, who you know, was responsible for basically giving me a, somewhere to focus and kind of start my journey and start the kind of rebuild of Eddie Quinn after you know, what happened to me. So yeah, it was a pretty, pretty uh, you know, horrendous time. My, my father just died about six months prior to that anyway. So you know, to, to nearly lose two uh, male uh, members of the family you know, in, in six months, it was a pretty rough time. So yeah, that's what I do. So I, my journey started off with the Japanese Jiu Jitsu. Uh, and then it progressed. Uh, I kind of, I'm a bit of a geek, and uh, I got the martial arts bug, and I started to research, you know, several different martial arts. So really, yeah, Japanese was the first one. Uh, but kind of, you know, I, I wanted to be this like all-round martial artist, like the rebuild. It was like, you know, I, I started to do um, traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu, where it was lots of throws, lots of locks, which I enjoyed. But you know, I'm a, I always say I'm, I'm a working-class kid from Birmingham. Uh, and, and I realised that, you know, very early on that, you know, on the street, you know, people don't bow before they hit you. You're not barefoot and you don't wear a, a, a white gi. Uh, so I kind of started to research different, different arts uh, to kind of be this all round martial arts uh, practitioner. Well, there was, there was no rehab, basically. I, um, after, after the extent of my, my, uh, my injuries, I was only in hospital for, a w for two weeks. Uh, yeah, I was discharged after 13 days and basically left to it. I had to go to, to, to different um, kind of outpatient appointments. But really, you know, 30 years ago, you, you kind of left your own devices. Um, there was, so there was no counter and there was no nothing. It was just like, you, you know, get on with it. I remember just looking at my record saying, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Quinn's uh, 18 and young enough to kind of shake it off and, and start again. So yeah, there, there was no rehab. You know, training in martial arts was my rehab basically. Um, I, I kind of figured I had, you know, two things to either go that way or go that way, and uh, it, it was quite could have quite easily gone that way. Um, but if it wasn't for the for the old boy, the old doctor, saying, you know, have you thought about taking a combat sport? He kind of spurred me on, and uh, you know, martial arts was my rehab. Yeah, so after the Japanese Jiu Jitsu, it was, uh, I started to, there, was, there was no internet in them there in, the, in those days. You know, this was like 1985. There was, there was nothing. Uh, there was, a, there was a, f a few Bruce Lee books around, Dan and Asanto books around at that time. But I had not heard of those guys anyway, because I, I didn't get into martial arts, you know, because of the kind of Bruce Lee boom, the Kung Fu boom. I got into it because, you know, I wanted to rebuild myself and I didn't want to, you know, have to go through what, you know, what, what, what I'd been through again. Um, but you know, I became a bit of a geek and researched different arts. And um, people talk about Muay Thai being a you know a great striking art, uh, and the guys were fit. And at this time, I you know I put quite a bit of weight on after the after the stabbing. So you know, I, I, training with with Steve in the Jiu Jitsu, you know, I lost four stone in weight. Um, really got the martial arts bug. Started to cross train in those days. People didn't cross train either, so I started like training. Um, um, the Jiu Jitsu, the Japanese traditional Jiu Jitsu, in with Muay Thai, um, and you know, I, I could, like I said, I could throw, I could, I could grapple, 
to a degree, but I couldn't punch my, you know, I couldn't fight sleep kind of thing. I, I couldn't punch my other paper bag. And um, I, that's why I started to research kind of striking art. So from Jiu Jitsu, I went straight into Muay Thai and uh, I started Muay Thai in 1990. Um, just because I think it's just one of those great foundation arts where, you know, you, you learn to kind of kick, punch, elbow, knee. Uh, you learn to get hit and, and learn to take a hit. And you also learn to stand and grapple and you get fit at the same time. So, you know, I, I, Muay Thai was like a, one of those great arts that just done it all for me. And uh, I, 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 I said my goodbyes to my Japanese teacher, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu teacher, and then started to train in the Muay Thai kind of pretty much full time. Um, but I was still petrified of knives. Um, let me just show you the kind of extent what a, when a, what, what a mess a knife can do. So if you can look here, you can see the kind of the stab wounds in the, in the liver, the heart area around here. Uh, but like the biggest mess really was, was done by the doctor to save my life. So I was still pretty much petrified of, of knives and uh, you know, being the son of an Irishman and stereotypical kind of Irishman, you know, I, I like bread, I like potatoes, I like Guinness, I like whiskey, uh, and I like butter on my bread. Um, but I, I couldn't use a butter knife. I couldn't basically use a knife. And I thought, you know what, I, I need to kind of hit this head on a little bit because it was getting too much. So, you know, I'd, I'd been training for maybe five years, but I was still like, still not f no, fully recovered from the, from the stabbing. Um, so I started to research, again being a bit of a geek, that research kind of arts that specialised in, in weaponry and in blades. And again through the like, Inner Santo books, kind of Filipino uh, martial arts were, were mentioned lots. Uh, and also the uh, Southeast Asian arts of, of Silat. So I then um, started to kind of research the Filipino arts, found a teacher in, in Nottingham, which is about 60 miles away from, from Birmingham. Uh, and start training the Filipino martial arts. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of had to hit that fear head on. You know, I, I couldn't kind of walk around it. It, it. it was like, I had to walk towards the fear, if you like. It was, it was, it was just an ongoing thing of, of, of turning up, of, of kind of, kind of starting before it starts that you know I'd agreed to make that decision to go and learn this art and I could have kind of bottled it and and carried on doing the arts that I, that I, that I, that I practice but the kind of fear was still there so basically you know well the honest answer was that I just had to keep on going and, and turning up uh, and uh, that's it really it's just perseverance and putting the flight flight time in how, how do you get good at anything you got you know you've got to put the work in uh, and I think to overcome that fear, I just had to do it more, um, which can be said in, in anything really. Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, for the past 25, 26 years, you know, I've kind of specialised in arts uh, of Southeast Asia, um, from, the, from the Filipino martial arts. Uh, to the, the, the Silat Malaysian um, Indonesian arts, which, you know, are blades are part of their culture. And that's what I teach now. You know, it's quite strange, really, because I've been absolutely petri petrified or something. But, but, you know, walking towards that fear and, and putting the flight time in. And, and now, you know, those arts are, are what, what I practice. So, yeah. I saw... It was either some footage or it was, um, I read something. It was about an art called Silat. Uh, and I just loved the way that the guys moved. So um, I, I, I kind of got on a plane and flew to Indonesia to try and find a guru in this art because you couldn't find any kind of Silat teachers around that time, you know, in the UK. And uh, I kind of came back with my tail between my legs because I just couldn't basically find a teacher out there. All the, all the people knew, you know, you're talking pre-internet again. So people knew teachers, but they always knew somebody that taught it, but they didn't do it. So I kind of came back um, with my tail between my legs and about, I don't know, maybe a month or so later, I attended a seminar in, um, in uh, Nottingham 
uh, by a guy called Rick Young, and I know Rick's just been doing some, you know, some some stuff for, for Woma TV as well. And uh, I, I attended Rick's seminar. Uh, I knew Rick anyway. He was kind of like one of my major role models, inspirations, you know. And uh, there was a guy called Chris Parker, and uh, Chris. I found out that Chris Parker was actually a SILAT teacher. So I uh, kind of approached Chris and said, you know, uh, I hear you teach SILAT. Uh, would you, you uh, would you teach me? And we exchanged telephone numbers, and he said, phone me, called him, and then that weekend I uh, drove to to Nottingham uh, with my training partner Steve Williams, and uh, I've been with the same teacher now for the past 23 years. So that kind of chance meeting to uh, to attending Rick seminar in in, in Nottingham was uh, a life changing experience for me and set me on a different path. I just found that he kind of ticked every box. The art itself, uh, for, for me, gave me everything that I was looking for. Um, and Chris is a teacher. I think, I think people don't realise that, you know, just you know, what great role models martial arts teachers are. Um, you know, at 18, I lost my dad. And I didn't have any brothers, or, you know, I had two older sisters. I have two older sisters, but I had no brothers. So I had no kind of major role models in my life. So my, my martial arts teachers were, were like my male role models. Uh, and finding Chris, it was just like, he, he kind of became, uh, and he is, you know, he's, like, he's been like a surrogate dad to me for the past 20 odd years. You know, it was Father's Day last week and I went up for my lesson and bought a bottle of scotch and said, happy Father's Day. You know, to, to this guy who's basically you know, been a sort of, sort of good father to me, because he he tells me how it is, not what I want to hear, how it is, uh, and he's you know apart from probably him and my wife, they're the only probably two people in my life who actually tell me you know when I'm being a you know when I need to kind of bring it back in again, and uh, yeah, he's he's been nothing but an inspiration and a complete and a uh, you know role model to me uh, and which I then try and carry on with my students. If I'm really honest with you, I just think I got very lucky with a teacher who could understand me, understand me uh, and for, for me Silla is helps me be a better person. I, I don't really understand, I don't really, I can't really explain that but the art and through the way that he's taught me, it's just helped me kind of live my life as, as, as somebody who just wants to help others uh, from, a, from a combative side. You know, people talk about being a very, very flowery art, but, you know, a lot of these kind of movements and these fluid movements that you see in the seal at, you know, you don't realise that all these movements, really, you've got a blade in. So which can look very flowery, is really disguised as something very, very, you know, don't say the word dangerous, but, you know, the, 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 you know, the art just ticks all the boxes. But it wasn't just the art, it wasn't just Silat. It, you know, it, it, was, it was the teacher. I don't care if, it was, if he was teaching, like, flower range, you know, I still think I'd have gone and trained with the guy. He was just something about him that, 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 that was special and changed my life. But for you know, Silat as, as an art, it gives you everything from, from stand-up fighting, you know, to, to fight on the ground. You know, even though, you know, when, when, we're, when we're stood up, we're still on the ground, people have this different, you know, we, ground fighting. Well, when you're stood up, you are still ground fighting. It's just that you've got two feet on the ground or, or you've got, your, you know, your body on the floor. So, so that for me, from, a, from a, a martial arts point of view, ticks all the boxes, gives me everything I need from, um, from upstairs to, to downstairs with or without a weapon. So, but again, like I said, it's not just the, the art for me, it was, you know, Striking lucky with a with a a great teacher. Every, everything is done in Nottingham. If I'm honest, um, I've, I have no need. I have no need. Uh, everything I everything I need is kind of 60 miles up the road from where I live in Solihull. Um, so no, I don't, I don't need to go back to Indonesia to to, to uh, Malaysia to train. Um, I'd like to because my teachers teacher is based out in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia so um, I'd like to go out there and, and spend some time with with, with Bapak Idris out there um, that, that's one of my 
that's one of my goals to do but no i don't i don't go to i've never never felt the need to go to indonesia or malaysia because everything i need is you know pretty much on my doorstep i've been to thailand several times because i you know i still teach thai boxing i still keep this old body of mine uh moving i think it's a great art to just keep sharpen the you know, keep the tools sharp uh even at the age of you know i'm 50 now so you know it still still keeps my body moving so i still pop out to thailand uh, when i can uh, and train in the camps out there or take take some of my guys out there uh but you no know, to answer your question no I, i don't need to go to indonesia or malaysia because everything i need is just up the road so the approach the, the approach was kind of born from from the principles of my selat training um my teacher told me to uh, purchase a couple of uh, malaysian galaks and they're like if, if you're not familiar with 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 uh, malaysian weaponry it's like like a big machete uh, and he said I'd, I'd, you know you he said your personality will come out using them so i don't know as i was told and i bought these galaks and i was training outside in the garden as i do and doing all my stuff out there uh, and i was teaching a muay thai class and uh one thursday evening in, in birmingham and i kind of stopped the class and i said guys i said let me just show you this i want to show you this movement and uh i started showing them this these these big forehand and backhand movements which you know i've not i've not like reinvented the wheel they're they're all in any weapons based arts uh, but it was kind of the way that was delivering it and the way it was coming across uh and again again you got to remember that you know if you can get kind of tight boxes and boxes on your side you know you you know you're on the right track so i showed them my tight boxing class you know these set of movements that were were coming out of me uh and uh that was a thursday and on the sunday i went to see chris and i told him about the movements and what i'd done in the tight boxing class and he went he's not been you know forthcoming with compliments over the years and he and he just said that is brilliant he went eddie quinn's the approach and uh he said i suggest you do some videos i was like really he went yeah and i've always been a bit of a uh, procrastinator and you know always had this kind of battle with confidence you know that the, the good cop the bad cop shall i do it shall i do it shall i do it shall i do it and i just thought you know what this feels right so um we had a pilot film done uh and uh I wanted to make sure that you know the material looked good that I didn't sound too thick you know with a strong brummy accent uh and uh we 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 saw the we saw the footage I took the I took the footage to see to Chris's house we watched it and Chris said you know the material that you've got is is you know is better than the pilot so uh one of my celeb brothers John he just filmed the uh, Danny the Santo series in uh, in Edinburgh uh and he still had the cameras so we went to his basement and we we filmed three uh approach DVDs uh I started to advertise them in Martial Arts Illustrated and suddenly the DVD started to sell all over the world from you know to America to Japan to Australia it was like crazy you know this this kind of working class kid from Birmingham suddenly was 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 selling you know DVDs all over the world uh and uh you know that that's that's basically how the approach was born um so you know like i said it, it was born out of my 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 kind of selat training uh what makes it different you know you know over the years it's the approach is about 8 years old now uh and the the approach i see it as something that's very effective it's very easy to learn and it doesn't actually take countless years of repetition repetition to to actually get good at it because you know I I make my living teaching children uh self defense um so I was kind of trying to relate the the bladed movement of the approach so the approach is like a forehand back and and very circular strikes so I was trying to relate these movements to what the body does natural because I can't go around taking blades to you know, the local school where I'm teaching kids So I was thinking, you know, this this movement here is exactly the same as throwing a ball. So I thought, okay. So we do the same movement throwing a ball, so we just make a fist, so we turn our hand into a hammer. So I tell the kids, 
you know, uh, when I teach uh, a lesson, turn your hand into a hammer. You are now the Incredible Hulk, you are now Thor. And the kids love it, of course. You know, they think they're some kind of Marvel character. Uh, and we relate the movement to throwing. So I was like, okay. And then the, the approach has a backhand movement, which is a blade that's cutting. And I thought, okay, what other movement is a natural movement that the human body knows how to do? For some reason, like I said at the start of the interview, I'm a bit of a geek. I thought, it's the same as skimming a frisbee. So, and all we need now is a delivery system, which are your legs. So every human being knows how to walk. Every human being knows how to throw. And for some reason, everybody knows if you get a frisbee in your hand, how to skim a frisbee. So I was going, okay. So this movement I use with a blade for all my kind of martial arts friends and students, I can relate it to every person in the world by going, if you can throw, if you can skim a frisbee, and if you can move your feet, i.e. walk, you can do the approach. And that's how it was born. Effective self-defense that can be learned in hours and not years. From the age of 10 months, 12 months, we had the ability to stand up and move our feet. We all had to throw a ball. You think about it. If we couldn't throw, as we were, you know, if we were cavemen, if we couldn't throw, how could we have kill, killed food for food? We couldn't. So if you wasn't able to have arms and shoulders, we'd have starved. So every human knows how to throw. And then I, I don't know the background regarding this backhand movement, but I just related to a frisbee because, like I say, yeah, if I gave you a frisbee now, well, you'd know exactly what to do with it. So, you know, that's it really. It's effective, easy to learn, and it doesn't take a lifetime of study. And it's gross motor skills. So these movements are massively gross. We're not looking at fine motor skills, because under pressure, fine motor skills just do not work. They go out the window. Yeah, under the stress of combat. You know, you know I've been there, you know, I, I always say, I've been there and I wear the T-shirt. You know, you might be wearing your Woma TV t-shirt. I'll wear my approach t-shirt. But if you look at me, again, I have to wear this till the day that I die, 24 hours a day, seven days a week until the day that I die. I actually wear the t-shirt, you know. Um, so there you go. The approach is, is always evolving. Um, last year, I, I kind of took down my website. I archived the, all the eight DVDs in the approach series because really I, f I felt like it didn't capture me anymore because I've evolved so much. I've gone from being pretty much a very unknown martial artist through the, through the approach, you know, being, you know, with my, with my DVDs in the approach, I've, you know, I've taught, you know, you've got to remember, I'm just a working class kid from Birmingham, you know, I've, I've taught all over the world now. From the, from the States, Australia, to the Middle East, to the Far East, all over Europe. Uh, I've, I've, you know, the approach has been taught to presidential bodyguard detachments, been prime minister bodyguard detachments, um, anti-poaching units in South Africa, um, you know, Olympic security, um, maritime security. The approach has just evolved from this idea, from basically me taking the advice of my teacher saying use these blades your, 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 your personality will come out in this and suddenly you know if, if I had to give it a name Will would still, there wouldn't be an approach my, my, pro, my teacher said that's great Eddie Quinn's the approach I'd have still been thinking of a name eight years later it wouldn't have happened but I decided to take some positive action because my whole life you know from the age of like you know I was like 43 when the approach 42, 43 when the approach you know, w was born. I'm 50 now. Um, my whole life has been pretty much, you know, a battle of, of shall I or shan't I, shall I or shan't I, talking myself out of it. And it just felt the right thing to do. So I took some action. Uh, and yeah, the, the approach is evolving the whole time. You know, from, 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 from the, what happened was that I had a, a, an email from a, a guy saying, thank you very much, Mr. Quinn, for your swift delivery of your DVDs. This was from San Diego, and he was a law enforcement officer. And he says, I finally found a way that I can strike without damaging my hand. Let me tell you why that's important. Because the approach is hand-friendly. You know, if I was to punch something, I'm going to damage my hand. 
you know, even boxers, when their hands are strapped and they've got gloves on, you know, you hit a pad wrong, you hit somebody wrong, you're still going to damage your hand. So the approach is, is better, pretty much turning this hand into the, into the Hulk hammer, into a Thor hammer. That's why, like I said, say to the kids, if I finally found a way of striking somebody without damaging my hand, let me tell you why this is important. He said, as a law enforcement officer, if I damage my, my hand in, in, in an arrest, how can I then pull out a weapon? So if he suddenly hit somebody, got a head, damaged his hand, some guy now is on drugs, pulls out a weapon himself to, to stab him. If his hand's doing this, how can he pull out his gun? How can he pull out a baton? How can he pull out gas? Potentially you've got an officer that's going to die. And that's how it kind of changed. That's how, it, that's how the approach kind of evolved from like becoming just something for martial artists to security professionals, to police, to military guys. Who, who kind of are the real warriors, you know, the guys who, who put, put their lives on the line every day. And that's when they started to get involved in it. So it's been great, really, because, you know, it's been well received from the martial arts public through also security pressures like, you know, like police, like military, everything else. But, but you know, and it's a great way to keep the kids safe. And... You know, and they just have great fun and, and learn at the same time. So I kind of I've gone real, you know, pretty much full circle with it. So the website went down. The, the the new website will be up and running hopefully. I've got a meeting next week with the web guy. So it's going to be the the blog of Eddie Quinn, martial arts teacher. So you'll have all the umbrella things of like the silat, the approach, and the child safe martial arts is you know like I said, this is how I make my living teaching kids. You know, I teach in many schools in my area. Um, so yeah the approach has evolved so much but it's, it's been pretty much pinpointed now to you know this is what the approach is seven eight years ago i didn't know what the approach was it hence all these kind of dvds it's just what was coming out of me but now you know I, I can get a group of people three hours learning the approach and you couldn't tell who was the most experienced one who walked in the room and the beginner because like i said the, the movements are all natural movements so, you know, you, you can't tell who's the most, after three hours, you couldn't tell who's been training for 10 years or who's just walked through the door for the first time. So the approach is evolving all the time. If it wasn't, if it didn't evolve, then I've been doing something wrong because, you know, constantly we should be evolving. You know, I, I'm a martial arts teacher. The teacher should be the best student. So I'm always learning, always learning. So, yeah, it's... It, it's going to evolve, you know, going to evolve, but pretty much as it is now, I know exactly what it is. And all, all I'm looking at now is just kind of fine, fine tuning, little better ways. You know, like, like Mikey Wright's strike mate machine, you know, that, that power of development thing that he's been working. You know, it's fine little things that, that, that you can do to, to increase your power. So, yeah, all, you, 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 you stop evolving, you die. Where do I see myself in 10 years time? I think I'll still be teaching, but I don't think I'll still be teaching martial arts. Oh. My teacher always said to me that you need to look after the kit. You've got to look after your body. Uh, and at the age of 50, and somebody who's been suffering with a bad back for the past maybe 10 years or so, um, you know, I've, I've come to the realization is that, you know, you really do need to look after the body as we start to age. And if I want longevity and I want to carry on doing what I do for the rest of my life, you know, I'll never retire, never retire. You know, being a martial arts teacher, being a martial artist is, is you know, who I am. It's what I do. So um, really it's to, it's to stay, stay healthy, to um, help as many people as I possibly can. People said to me, you're on a mission, aren't you, Eddie? It's like, I don't know about a mission, but I do, before I die, want to be able to help as many people stay safe as I possibly can. So those are the two things, really keep my body healthy uh, and keep on teaching and help as many people, three things, and help as many people as I possibly can, Will. <laughs> <laughs>